If you've seen my previous videos on cholesterol, they have now gone and I'll explain why. I got rethinking about all things cholesterol after coming across the cholesterol levels of the Hadza. The Hadza are modern day hunter gatherers in Tanzania. They may offer the best insight we have into the physiology and lifestyle patterns of humans living in a natural state. They have been found to have low levels of both total cholesterol and LDL. They also have high activity levels, low blood glucose measurements, normal blood pressure and a normal BMI. And they avoid most of the diseases of civilization that we suffer from, including cardiovascular disease. This study on the Chimane, a forager horticulturalist population of the Bolivian Amazon, who have the lowest reported levels of coronary artery disease of any population recorded to date, states, These findings suggest that coronary atherosclerosis can be avoided in most people by achieving a lifetime with very low LDL, low blood pressure, low glucose, normal body mass index, no smoking, and plenty of physical activity. The relative contributions of each are still to be determined. If you do generally consider these sorts of populations to be running the most physiologically normal lifestyle, then you might end up with a conclusion like this. Optimal low density lipoprotein is 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter. Lower is better and physiologically normal. That equates to an LDL of 1.3 to 1.8 in the UK. Atherosclerosis is endemic in our population, in part because the average person's LDL level is approximately twice the normal physiologic level. You will have your own views on how relevant data from these sort of populations are. Obviously, they are living very different lifestyles to us. Maybe there are factors that mean we shouldn't immediately extrapolate their figures to us. But I certainly don't want to dismiss their values either. I'll use two consensus statements from the European Atherosclerosis Society consensus panel to look at the orthodox position on LDL. And yes, the conflict of interest sections are a long list of drug company funding. This is a small portion of a diagram from one of those consensus statements. One question is, if you were to optimize all of the factors along the top here in gray, does that mean having high levels of LDL is no longer a concern? Part of this question is related to the quality of LDL, which the consensus statements do discuss. Very low density lipoprotein triglyceride levels are a major determinant of the LDL subfraction profile. They talk about how insulin resistance, among other things, can lead to VLDL overproduction and therefore high fasting triglyceride levels. As plasma triglyceride levels rise, the profile shifts from a predominance of large particles to small dense LDL. An LDL subfraction profile in which small particles predominate is part of an atherogenic dyslipidemia in which remnant lipoproteins are also abundant. The residence time of LDL in the circulation may be the critical factor in the relationship between plasma LDL subclass level and atherosclerosis risk as it determines both exposure of arterial tissue to LDL particles and the potential of LDL to undergo pro-atherogenic intravascular modifications such as oxidation. Increased plasma residence time can result from deficiency or dysfunction of LDL receptors as in familial hypercholesterolemia or from structural or compositional features of LDL particles that impair their binding affinity for LDL receptors as for small dense LDL. So whilst the consensus statements do discuss LDL quality, the focus is mostly on quantity because you still have more potential LDL interactions with the arterial wall and therefore elevated levels of LDL are thought to be a problem in any situation. Consistent evidence from numerous and multiple different types of clinical and genetic studies unequivocally establishes that LDL causes atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. They give evidence from inherited disorders of lipid metabolism like familial hypercholesterolemia, evidence from epidemiological studies and randomized control trials of LDL lowering therapies, and evidence from Mendelian randomization studies. And given that there is concordance between multiple lines of evidence, they state that LDL is not merely a biomarker of increased risk, 
but a causal factor in the pathophysiology of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The causal effect of LDL on the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is determined by both the absolute magnitude and the cumulative duration of exposure to LDL-C. So both how high your level is and how many years it has been at that height for. In my previous videos, I cited this study that states, among primary prevention type patients aged 50 to 89 years without diabetes and not on statin therapy, the lowest risk for long-term mortality appears to exist in the wide LDLC range of 100 to 189 milligrams per deciliter, which is much higher than current recommendations. In the UK, that is 2.5 all the way up to 4.9 just for LDL. For counselling these patients, minimal consideration should be given to LDLC concentration. They suggest giving more consideration to the total cholesterol to HDL ratio and the triglycerides to HDL ratio and focusing on weight, blood pressure, blood sugar, physical activity, avoidance of smoking and stress reduction. And these are their graphs, incidence of death on the vertical increasing as you go up. So you would think you want to be low down on these charts. And indeed, if you have low triglycerides and high HDL, you do end up low down on this very nice straight line, suggesting this is the clear metric to go with rather than the LDL, where it looks like an LDL in the recommended range of under 100 might be a bad thing. But some problems. If I get to 50 in good health and my LDL is, let's say, 80, which in the UK is 2 millimoles per litre, am I going to think to myself, it really would be better if my LDL was 150? Better try and get it higher, then I'm more likely to survive. No, I'm never going to think that. This is correlation. I won't be trying to boost my LDL up. Would I give a thumbs up to an unhealthy patient with an LDL above 100? No, because I would encourage them to work on lifestyle changes to improve their health, and those lifestyle changes may also result in a reduction of their LDL. Hardly something of concern. So in hindsight, if I'm quick to dismiss the relevance of studies like this one in these sort of situations, I shouldn't be using them at all to form views on LDL, which is why my previous videos had to go. And if it's tempting to dismiss studies cited by the consensus statements because maybe they were done on unhealthy populations that probably haven't got this top row of risk factors sorted out, then it would be inconsistent to cite correlation studies done on similar populations to support an alternate viewpoint. And so I don't think I'm left with anything robust enough to challenge the orthodox position with. Do let me know what you think down below. Lots of your previous comments certainly got me rethinking, which is always good. Thanks for watching.